This episode is brought to you by Indie Film Hustle Academy, where filmmakers and screenwriters go to learn from top Hollywood industry professionals. Learn more at ifhacademy.com. How did you get Brothers McMullen off the ground? Where, like, what made you think that you like you can make it? <laughs> I mean, it, I mean, you, you, it was, it's nuts. It's like now you look at it, and you're like, oh well, everyone could do that. But back then, there was, there was no internet. There was no knowledge about this, really. So how did you do it, man? Um, I mean, it's a crazy long story, and you just tell me to switch gears when you're <laughs> so, Sure, sure. I'm trying to remember, because it's like, I make the film 28 years ago when I am, basically I start when I'm 24, I think. Mm-hmm. So um, coming out of film school, like you said, I'm a, I'm a production assistant at a television show in New York which basically my job was driving the van and setting up the lights. That's the extent of what I did. Um, So I had plenty of time. It was a job that required no mental focus at all. So I spent all my time writing screenplays. I, I, at the time, you know, one of the guys we forgot to mention is Tarantino and Reservoir Dogs. Well, there's that guy. (laughs) Um, So I see Reservoir Dogs and I'm like, okay, that is what I need to write. So I probably write in my four years or three and a half years out of film school, five feature length scripts. Three of them are Reservoir Dog ripoffs. I am pouring through the trades every day, trying to find or identify the agents or managers who sign first time screenwriters. So that's who I'm sending all of my scripts to. Smart. All right. And every day, my dad told me something. He's like, look, there's absolutely another filmmaker out there who is outworking you. So you need to make sure every day you do one little thing to chip away at the brick wall that separates you from the dream. So that meant, you know, I'm going to write a scene in my script or I'm going to write another letter to an agent or I'm going to send my short film into another film festival. Every day I made sure I did one little thing. So I write all these scripts, I send them out, I get nothing but rejection letters back. And... Um, uh, I, I come to the conclusion, and this has happened to me a couple of times in my career, where I kind of recognize, well, maybe I'm just not that good. You know, maybe it isn't that they uh, don't, un- they can't recognize what a talent I am. Right. Maybe I'm just actually not talented. <laughs> right. Maybe I need to go back to school and learn a little bit more. Right. And at the time, um, I see an ad for the Robert McKee Story Structure class. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I- so a lot of people might poo-poo that. No, you know, traditional Hollywood uh, structure is BS. You know, three acts. Don't pay any attention to that. For me, it was it was incredible. I go there, and and you know, you learn a lot of this stuff, and you're you know, screenwriting one on one stuff in film school. But again, you know, a lot of it you you forget, or if, you know, if you want to be like a cool arty kind of kid, you're dismissive of that stuff. Mm-hmm. At this point, after five rejected screenplays, I am no longer thinking I'm hot shit. I am not dismissive of anything. I recognize I need to learn. Right. So I take the class and, you know, a couple of things that um, he said uh, that really struck a chord with me. One was, you know, what is your favorite genre of film? What do you like love to watch? That is the next screenplay that you should be writing. You like horror? Write a horror script. You like you know, action, do that. And at the time, I was like a massive Truffaut and Woody Allen fan. Like, that's all I was doing. Uh, it was all I was watching. So I was like, okay, that's what I'm going to do. Basically, relationship, comedy, drama, a little bit of an ensemble. Um, you know, I'd look at those Woody Allen films and I'd be like, okay, that's a oneer. You know, for people, I'm mean, everyone listening to you, I think mm-hmm. knows what a oneer is, but one shot without a cut that lasts almost two minutes of two people walking down a street in Manhattan talking about their relationships. Okay, I know from my my film school days, that's about as easy as you can do with no money. Uh, uh, that's as, as easy a scene as you can pull off compared to shooting, let's say, an interior scene in a crowded restaurant where I'm going to need the higher extras and whatever. Mm-hmm. So as I sit down, as I, and when I leave McKee, I'm like, All right, that's what I'm going to do. I know that's the genre that I want to play in. Um, I decided to make an ensemble because I knew from my uh, my student films that when you're not paying your actors, there's no guarantee that any of them are ever going to show up. You know, especially in New York, 
everybody's got other jobs, they're waiting tables, they're working in a gym. Um, you know, you would have people just bail on you in the middle of a shoot. So I said, if I have an ensemble and I cast myself and my girlfriend opposite me, I know that even if this thing blows up, I have a short film. And that's why, and, and it's a crazy way to write a screenplay, but I wrote it as four sort of different movies. The okay. first movie was the three, and then I listed all the locations that I knew I could get for free. Mm -hmm. So I knew I could get my parents' house. So that was location number one. Then I knew every street corner and sidewalk and public park in New York City, I knew from my working in news days, uh, you did not, first of all, there was no cost to shoot there. And you would never be bothered. No cop would ever ask him, certainly in the early 90s in New York, if you had a permit to shoot. Not when New York was still a little gritty then. They could care less about three students out with a camera. Right. So I was like, so that's what the movie will be. Uh, I'll have these three brothers. And the one movie is the movie that takes place in their house. And then they'll each have a girlfriend in Manhattan. And those will be my other three short films. So I kept thinking if it didn't work out. Wow. I could have a 25 minute movie, 50 minute movie, 75 minute movie, or a feature. So, so you actually backed into, like you backed into this film w with disaster in mind. Like- oh, totally, totally, reverse engineered the whole thing. It's amazing, that's remarkable. Yeah. I had never heard that part of the, of the, of the, of the myth, if you will. <laughs> so that's kind of how I laid out the script. Right. And, um, you know, so then uh, there was an article in the IFP's old magazine, The Independent, hmm. And they did an article on Living End, Laws of Gravity, and I forget, the, maybe one of the Hal Hartley movies. And they basically broke down those budgets. And they were, like I said earlier, one was 23, one was 28, one was like 35. And I looked at that and I said, based on my experiences with my student films, I was like, I think I can pull this McMullen script off for about 25,000. I think I can get it in the can for 25. So my old man, you know, again, my dad was a cop in New York. I am a working class kid, grew up with no money, no connections in the business. We knew a lawyer. And <laughs> my dad convinced this guy to put together a limited partnership. And we were going to sell five $5,000 shares to get the 25 grand. He knew a guy who works on Wall Street. That guy gave him five grand. And that's all we raised. Yeah, so basically, uh, we raised $5,000. I convince my dad to give me about another four. And I basically tell him and this guy, with the nine, let me just go and shoot together uh, sort of a sizzle reel, a trailer, and we'll use that to raise more money. But I knew that I was gonna try and shoot the entire film for $9,000. That was my goal. Um, so I set out, I put an ad in Backstage Magazine that basically says, you know, uh, no budget indie, non-union, no pay, but we'll feed you. It's New York City, so I probably got 2,500 headshots. Mm -hmm. Through all the headshots. And then there's some, you know, great stories about, you know, how I was able to get some of these actors. But, you know, the part of Molly, the, the older brother's wife, probably auditioned 15, 20 actresses. And I'm thinking to myself, the, the script is terrible because the scenes that these uh, young actresses were reading just weren't playing. Um, and I'm sitting behind the camera shooting her audition, and I'm like, oh my God, like, this kid is good. Wow, maybe these scenes aren't so terrible. So Connie ends up being cast in the movie, and throughout the production, Connie was kind of like our, um, uh, you know, she was our ringer. We just knew like, okay, She's like really the super talented one here. Um, you know, when you're acting opposite her, you better bring your A game. And, and uh, so, so we get Connie in the movie. The other actors are all, uh, and like Connie, nobody had ever been on a set before. Nobody had ever been in front of a camera before. Um, and I set out to go uh, make this film. We probably shot about six days um, over the course of maybe three weeks, um, and then I kind of run out of money. Um, but I don't let the cast know that. Um, and what I did do, we ended up shooting 12 days over the course of eight months. And what I would do is I would save up some money from work. I'd hit my dad up for a little bit of money. A camera guy was working with um, Dick Fisher would say, hey, look, uh, I'm not working this Saturday and Sunday. I have the camera. 
a buddy of mine can, is available to do sound. Who can you get from the cast that's available? And, you know, I would then go and say, all right, Jack and Mike are available. Let me see what scenes are still not shot. Or I'd listen. <laughs> and then the other crazy thing I did was it was, you know, we shot 16 millimeter. Right. We couldn't afford to buy any new cans of film. So oh, short ends. Short ends. But, and, and 16, not even super 16, but 16 yeah. short ends. Yeah, oh, yeah. you had like leftover stuff from industrials. <laughs> so, um, so it was cheaper for me to re-enroll in Hunter College for one class, which I think was probably, I don't know at the time, probably 300 bucks. Um, so I can get a student ID because for the short ends with your student ID, it was something like 25% off or something like that. So I re-enroll in school Smart. in order to get the cheaper price on the short ends. But then, of course, when we can't afford to develop anything until we're done shooting. So eight months after we get these 12 days done, we develop stuff. And then, you know, from short ends, a lot of times some of that, that film has already been exposed. So, you know, it made the editing a little bit easier when you do like, OK, well, we're cutting that scene because we just don't have that scene. So wait a minute. So you had eight months that you had a bunch of film reels in your in your in your well, apartment. After those first six days, we're just, you know, Dick says, hey, I'm free on this day. I say, great. I go buy some film stock. Right. I call the actors. I come up with the, the scenes. We go shoot those two days. And then it's like, all right, when are we going to shoot again? I have no idea. But, but So how long were you with the movie in the can before you got it developed? All right. So after we, once we finished shooting, we had everything at that point, then I go to the Duark Film Labs and there was a great guy who ran the place named Dick Young, and Bob Smith. Those are the two guys who ran it. And to their credit, they were real supporters, supporters of indie film and young folks in New York trying to make it happen. So, you know, my dad went down with me there and explained to them, hey, I'll vouch for Eddie, but, um, you know, he's got this film. Here's all the, the film. We'd love to get it processed. Can't pay for it all now, but if you can defer those costs, we'll slowly pay it off over time. And they were generous, generous wow. enough to do So like lay, almost like layaway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and payment plan for, for development. That, that, that world does not exist now. You have to find some very special people. I mean, could you imagine, though, trying to shoot an indie film on 16 millimeter today on short ends? Like, that's Did, why, for me, and I've heard you talk about it as well, it is so exciting right now, if you're a mm -hmm. young indie filmmaker, that you can pick up this friggin' thing, your phone, and go and make a feature that's going to look 100 times better than Brothers McMullen. Look, oh. <laughs> you know, hands down. Le the lenses you can get, the cameras you get. I mean, I shot I shot a whole feature on a, a little pocket camera uh, and just got vintage lenses and just went out and shot a movie in four days. And it, and it got into it. It looks stunning. Projected at the Chinese theater on a 2K up res. Stunning. Most beautiful wow. thing I've ever shot. And I've shot things with much bigger budgets. And yeah. it was just this little 1080p camera. It was just gorgeous. So, and now there's like four and 6K cameras in uh, like the yeah. little pockets. And it's just, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Yeah. So you, you edit the, so you got, get everything developed on the layaway. <laughs> it's a fucking great story. Uh, a layaway. Then you're editing it. I'm assuming what this is. No, so it gets even crazier. So we yeah. transfer the film to beta because I work in beta SP. Tonight. Beta SP, of course. And uh, they cut the show on beta. So what me and Dick would do is, uh, at the end of the night, like if we had a movie premiere, let's say, because we covered mm -hmm. those kind of things, we were the last people in the office. We'd leave the side door of the office open when we left, <laughs> go next door to the Mayflower Hotel, have a drink, come back into the building at midnight, and then edit till five in the morning using their um, editing bays. And the uh, and permit. Without without permission, so yeah. always ask for forgiveness, never for permission. Exactly. So all right, so you you transfer everything to beta, because um, I used to cut on tape as well on beta SP. Is there a film print of this that's not a transfer from video? Did you ever go back to the neg on anything? Yeah, yeah. Eventually did. Okay, but but, but but at first you just cut together a video edit of that. And yeah. Did you color grade? You didn't color grade no. that. No, there's no color grade. Whatever it was, it was. Whatever it was, it was. No sound mix, no nothing. Um, other than, you know, we basically, at the time, we 
just borrowed all of this traditional Irish folk music from this musician named Seamus Egan. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, I'll tell you the story of like the great ending that happened for Seamus. But at the time, you know, I, I couldn't afford a composer. And I thought, all right, we'll just use needle drops from this guy. And he was a friend of a friend of a friend. So I mm-hmm. knew that I could get to him eventually. But at the time, I was like, I need music for the film. Right. I have no idea what's going to happen with this movie. And really, when I make the film, certainly you have the dream that maybe it'll get picked up for distribution. But as I said earlier, you know, for five years, I'm sending out my scripts. I can't get even a phone call back from an right. agent. I'm hoping the film will be something of a calling card and that maybe nothing else will go to a festival. Someone will see it and I'll get an agent. Um, so, uh, we cut the film, transfer it to VHS at the time. It's two hours long. Uh, we're both exhausted. I mean, I know it's still a rough cut, but you know, it's your first film. It's your baby. I don't know what scenes to cut. So, um, I knock off a bunch of, you know, VHS copies of it. And then I start the process of doing the same thing. I'm pouring through the trades. Who are the agents who are signing first time filmmakers? Um, What are the film festivals? What are the production companies and the distribution companies? Uh, Send it out everywhere, film festivals, a year's worth of rejections. Um, And then the, you know, the, the, the famous story is the, the Redford Sundance story. Right. So, you know, I'm working at entertainment tonight. Redford is there to do press for, I believe it was Quiz Show. Mm-hmm. Um, I I know that, you know, obviously Redford, Sundance, I take one of these rough cuts with me. Um, and I have my little, you know, 30 second spiel uh, rehearsed so that when he gets up with his PR person, and usually you shoot these junkets in a, um, in a big hotel. So I know he's gonna go out the main room, I'll go out the second bedroom, cut him off as he's getting into the elevator, give him the spiel, hand him the tape, and we'll see what happens. So that's exactly what I do. And he listens to me and he says, oh, okay, great. Well, we'll have someone take a look at it. And he hands it to his PR person and the elevator's door, the elevator door is closed and that's it. And I think, uh, well, I guess, you know, you know, I was kind of hoping he would want to, me to jump in the elevator and hear more about it. it <laughs> and, and just get, take, take the private plane to his house and then, you know, all that stuff. Of course, of course. Our no, we're on our way. <laughs> um, um, doesn't work that way. But two months later, I'm at work um, and I get a phone call from Jeff Gilmore, who was the yeah. uh, programmer at Sundance at the time. And Jeff says, hey, Eddie, so we're, hey, Ed, we got this uh, movie here. It says it's a rough cut. Just want to know if you finished it. I lie. I say, yes, of course I did. He says, oh, it says a rough cut, two hours. What's the running time now? I say 95 minutes because, you know, the Truffaut films, the Woody Allen films are all roughly, you know, you know under 100 right. minutes. Well, that's right. our job. And uh, he says, well, what, what scenes did you cut? And by this point now, you know, the, the movie's a year old. So mm-hmm. I've kind of seen it and, and I'm less in love with it. So there's a handful of scenes I know I want to cut, and then I just riff and name some other scenes. And he says, you know what? Actually, that sounds pretty good. All right, we'll be in touch. Two weeks later, they call up, and they say you're in. So now that's probably September. So hold on a second. When you get that call, what is that? I mean, like... I'm in the office, and all of the guys that I work with, you know, the crew guys, they've all worked on the movie with me. You know, like, they've all done sound for me. Right, yeah. (laughs) So they're, they're, you know, like they know, you know, what we're doing with the editing machines. So they're all giving me high fives and everybody's cheering and like, I can't believe it. Holy shit. Sure, you know, yeah. Our little Eddie, our little Eddie's, he, he made good. He's, he's going to get, he's going to go to the show. That's exactly, exactly <laughs> what it was. Like. So, um, so now though, I have to raise another 25 grand at a minimum to finish the film, right. you know, because it's cut on beta. So I got to go back to the negative recut it right because yeah um, and blow it up to 35 and you know i've never done that before i don't know how to do that you know my student films that uh that i made i cut myself on a little like moviola um slicer Mm -hmm. you know we had to sync up your 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 mag sound to your picture and tape it together i was like i can't do that for a 95 minute long movie so um i i can't remember exactly how but um, I'm put in touch with Ted Hope and James Seamus at Good Machine. Mm-hmm. And those are the guys who really, you know, quite honestly at that time took me under their wing. Uh, they came on as producers uh, and they 
helped me, you know, not only they taught me how to finish a film, but Ted was really invaluable in the editing room with me. You know, I knew, I knew 20 minutes I could cut out of the movie like that. But that last 10 uh, was tough. And he gave me two great bits of advice. He goes, look, I'm telling you, you don't need the scene. And if the scene is so great, use it in another one of your films. Needless Done. to say, needless to say, the scene is never so good that you end up revisiting it. Or at least it <laughs> wasn't in that case. The other thing he said is, um, how many times have you walked out of a movie and said, that hey, was a pretty good movie, but there was that 20 minutes in the middle. It was a little, you know, kind of dragged there. Because nobody ever walks out of the theater and says, God, it was a movie, it was a really good movie, but it was too short. He's like, I'm telling you, let's get this thing down to 95. You got a nice pre- breezy comedy here, puts a smile on your face, mm-hmm. like, Get people in and out, and I'm telling you, they're going to enjoy it. And it was, I mean, it was great, great advice. And that's what we did. Um, so, and the interesting thing was, because we were up against the deadline for Sundance, and I might have the dates exactly wrong, it's, you know, sure, 26 sure. years ago, but I had to fly to Sundance for the start of the festival, and I don't know if they still do it, but they would have like a filmmaker orientation, yeah. and there were things that you did with all the filmmakers those first couple of days. Um and our first screening is until four days after that. Ted has to stay in New York because, like, he has to wait for the blow-up to happen. So do our the blow-up. Ted grabs it. That day, goes to the airport, gets on the plane, flies to Sundance. We screen the next morning at the Egyptian. So Jeez. I never even get to see the film projected until, until the our first screening at Sundance. Jesus Christ. And then and then as as the legend goes, then there's there's a uh, was there a bidding war for it? Um how did that there was go? No bidding war. Um we uh Tom Rothman at Fox Searchlight, you know, which was a brand new company, McMullen was the first movie they ever released. Um <laughs> he uh he was at the first screening. And again, the funny thing is so they tell us like and maybe it was because of the Redford thing, like there were 18 movies in and we were the 19th. So even on my flight to Park City, there was like an article listing all the movies in competition. We weren't even mentioned. So we were a little bit of oh. the also ran. So you can imagine that. That, oh, that, that, that feeling is like, I'm, 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 it's, are we, are we yeah, there? Yeah. It's because you just can't pick up Bob and call Bob at this point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can't even pick up a phone and do anything like that. Right. right. Um, um, so anyhow, you know, so we had, a good crowd at the festival. We, I, again, to my memory, we did not have many buyers there other than uh, Searchlight. And at that screening, um, you know, it was pretty great. It was like the reaction was great. Got to meet a lot of people and a bunch of agents and managers. And afterwards, they'd given you their business cards. I'm like, got to come out to play. We got to do lunch and all that. But, you know, Rothman was there. And that night um, over dinner, before even our second screening, we sold the movie to Searchlight. And what, if you might be asking, what was the, the, the final sales for it? We sold it uh, for 250 Oh, jeez. You must have been ecstatic. <laughs> we were through the roof. I mean, we could not believe it. Jesus. Um, and we had some box office bumps built into that um, that would have gotten us to a half million. Uh, if the movie basically doubled Clerks' domestic box office, and I think Clerks at the time – did 1.2 or something like that. Yeah. So the idea that the movie would do 2 million, they thought was an absurd notion. Like it'll never get there. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's, um, of course, there's no stars in it. It's, you know, it was a $27,000 movie. Yeah, yeah. None of the indie movies did, none of those little ones that we talked about, you know, they would do 400, 500, 600. Yeah, mariachi, mariachi, I, mean, I think. Was, Mariachi with Columbia Pictures pushing it and put a million dollars in remastering it. Still only pulled in like a couple mil, like two or three really? mil theatrically, no. if I remember correctly. So it wasn't like it was a blockbuster. Yeah, I mean, but yours was. <laughs> yeah, so then we end up making, you know, it ends up doing $10 million. Jesus. Um, which is just, you know, just nuts. But the, 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 you know, I was talking about the guys at Good Machine. And the other great bit of advice was from James Seamus. And he was like, look, Eddie, when you're at the festival, who knows if we're going to sell the movie? But right. I'm telling you, like those 10 days, you will never be hotter. Like there's a feeding frenzy that happens at the festival and, you know, and we see it every year, you know, these movies that sell for a ton of money at the festival that, you know, whether they warrant or not, who cares? Like filmmakers are getting paid. That's a good thing. Um, but he's like, 
you better have another screenplay in your hand because they will ask you, what do you want to do next? And if you could hand them a script and say, I'm doing this next, you'll get that thing greenlit in a hurry. So I quickly wrote basically what I thought was a funnier version of Brothers McMullen because we didn't really think we would sell Brothers McMullen. No. So that movie was She's the One. And, you know, <laughs> Rothman basically said what Seamus said he was going to say. What do you want to do next? I said, I want to do this. Here's the script for She's the One. And within a week, that was greenlit. So, you know, I go out to L.A. for the first time in my life as a guy who sold a movie to Fox Searchlight. And now I've got my second film greenlit with a $3 million budget. 